Today's guest grew up in the Victorian town of Ballarat and earlier this year she took the basketball world by storm when she first led her college side Virginia Tech Hokies to the iconic NCAA Final Four tournament for the first time in their history. Along the way, she won the ACC tournament MVP, broke keeps of records and was voted most underrated player by other college players across America. Georgia Amor, hi and thanks so much for joining me. Hi, thanks for having me. It's good to be here. Yeah, it's been great just, you know, watching you play over the last couple of months. So I'm so happy that I can finally chat to you. Uh, Thank you. Just first of all, you're currently back in Australia for a few weeks. What was the first really Aussie thing that you did or maybe ate when you got back to Australia? Oh, actually, I, the day I landed, it was like 6am and it was Mother's Day. <laughs> so we had a nice Mother's Day lunch. So it was a roast and like sausage rolls and all of that. Miss out on a lot of that over in America. So from the get-go, I pretty much had a a good coffee and then a really solid Mother's Day lunch. I know that like me, you really love Nando's. How many times have you been there oh, since landing? Uh, not enough. I've been like <laughs> twice because my teammates are here right now too. So we're traveling all around, but um, I had it twice and it never misses. I love it so much. I've actually been to the one in DC and it's not nearly as good as <laughs> the ones here. Maybe one day we'll have to go to one together. <laughs> For sure. What's your order? Um, I usually just get like chips and chicken and the corn. The corn is definitely really good. <laughs> yeah. Do you get peri salt or? Yeah, it's good, but I can't really handle like spice or anything. So I have to do <laughs> anything mild, but yeah, Fair it's, enough. it's good. Fair uh, enough. And I guess when you do come back to Australia during the off season, does your family ever make any comments about maybe your accent changing? <laughs> yeah, I have definitely a little bit of an American twang. Um, so I went to college in 2020 and that's when COVID happened. So I ended up getting stuck over there, um, for like two years. So that's when my accent really like <laughs> got a little bit of a twang. It was really bad. So I, when I got home last year, I was honestly copping a bit more flack for it last year than I am this year, but doesn't mean that it's not there. I'm sure they're not complaining about it though. Um, yeah. But- Speaking about family, there's a pretty well-known story about when you first started playing basketball as a five-year-old. You were sitting in the stands watching some cousins play, I think, and then basically they asked you to come out of the crowd and play, and you were wearing thongs or flip-flops for Americans. I need to know more yeah. about the story, like how old were you? <laughs> I was really, really young, and I was watching my cousin Keely play. She actually plays um, in America too, so I've kind of just followed her footsteps. But, yeah, they – pretty much got someone got fouled out and I just got brought down onto the court wearing thongs but if I'm telling this thing I'm going to back flops otherwise they get shocked um was wearing thongs and ever since then just started playing domestically and then yeah I did read that you played you know like you mentioned quite a few other sports growing up and I know you love your Aussie rules football as well when did you kind of make the choice on which sport to focus on and why did you choose basketball mm-hmm. um so I loved footy, but I think it got to the point where, well, I, I quit in high school really because it got to the point where I was getting a bit serious with basketball. Um, I was doing like development squad, just WNBL, um, just like little things here and there. And I'm like, there's honestly more opportunity for me basketball wise than there is footy. Um, and I knew that the potential for me to travel with basketball was a lot larger than it would be with footy. Um, so I just, it wasn't really a hard decision. It was probably more like 70, 30 basketball wise um growing up but yeah honestly I just knew there was more opportunity with basketball so that's why I chose it. Her way does have quite a few um followers who love Aussie rules actually so I guess hypothetically if you were to be playing it now what kind of player would you be or maybe if there's a player you could compare yourself to? Oh I'm not going to compare myself to her but I love me so many Conti she is a beast (laughs) um I wouldn't compare myself to her, but if I was playing, I would look up to her to play like her for sure. You could definitely play like her with a lot of, like, you know, just a bit of training. You're already a great basketball player. (laughs) Thank you. I'm always interested to hear who athletes' idols were when they were younger. So who did you look up to apart from her, I guess? Yeah, so a big thing for me too is when we made the Final Four, I had so many Australians reach out. Like I had, you know, Lauren Jackson, Leilani Mitchell, um, all those girls that I used to watch as a kid um, and even like Patty Mills sent me a video which was like really insane so I would say a lot of just Australian basketballs in general um, just watching them grow up you know Leilani Mitchell especially you know she's short <laughs> so I kind of resonated with that um, 
but it was cool when we got to the final four, you know, like the outpouring of support from the people that I looked up to was pretty insane. And I still look up to them. Like it, it hasn't stopped. That must have been pretty overwhelming and just crazy, just suddenly getting sent a bunch of, you know, messages from like the greatest of all time. I know, it was insane. And the crazy thing is too, is like I missed a lot of it. Like Stu Bird, like I was on Stu Bird's story and I completely missed it until oh, my wow. teammate like told me like the media engagement in the final four is insane. So but it doesn't mean that I didn't I eventually saw everything that people saw uh sent to me. So yeah, it was it was a shock really. Yeah, well wow, that's really crazy. Um and so you were pretty focused on basketball, like you said, and you started making all of these, you know, rep junior teams for Victoria and Australia. And you were part of the under-17 World Cup team for Australia that won bronze in 2018. A couple of your teammates in that team were Shyla Hill and Jane Melbourne, who were already Opals. And there's quite a few from that team that are playing college basketball in the US. What are your memories of that tournament? Yeah, that tournament, I mean, we had a really, really solid team. You look back on it and you look at all the girls, as you said, Shyla and Jade, oh my gosh, they're insane. And Jade right now killing it as the youngest player in the WNBA. Um, and then, you know, you know, Agnes, she goes to, oh, sorry, transferred. She's now at TCU. Um, you know, Izzy Palmer, she's at Utah right now. Um, Alex Fowler tore it up with Portland. So a lot of those girls, you know, we still keep in contact with each other. Um, you know, we played on that tournament and I just remember a lot of laughs, really. I think a lot of things that Australian teams have that a lot of other teams don't have is just that that, that banter and that good laughs and all of that, you know. We knew when to get serious, but we took things a lot lightly off the court too. So just a lot of laughs really. And just knowing when to get down to business, but also just having a a big laugh off the court really. Um, I actually messaged Jade, who is currently playing with Seattle, as you'll know, for some dirt on you. But as you know, Jade <laughs> is the nicest person in the world. And she told me that when you guys were younger, you always had good taste in music and you love to hit the dance floor. Is that all still true? Yeah. <laughs> yeah and I would I would carry the UE broom around and you know just play music and I think at Worlds too we got into some snacks we were eating a lot I think we bought like Nutella jars and probably shouldn't be spilling this because I don't think we're supposed to take this but just sitting there and just absolutely demolishing a whole box of shapes like eating and dancing was our forte did you have a favorite song then to dance to a jade oh I, we have a playlist from when we were at Worlds. <laughs> I'll pull it up because it's still on my Spotify and I still give it a listen. That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. So we, we, well, we played like Italy and I remember like walking past them and playing that's more. <laughs> um, I don't know. I guess my Spotify is not working right now. <laughs> it just crashed, but I do have a playlist. So if you look at my Spotify, you'll see the world playlist. That's pretty cool. Um, and just getting back to the bronze medal game. So the year after that bronze medal, you decided to go and play college basketball. And it seems like some young players just want to go and play college basketball and others like Shiloh and Jade, for example, like to stay in Australia and play in the WNBL. Can you talk a bit about why you decided to go over to play in college? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I really wasn't sold on college at all. I was like, I'll talk to some schools, I'll go on some visits and see how it is. And then, you know, I'll try it out. The worst I can do is say I tried and come back. So I went on my visits with like no intention of committing on spot. Um, and I think when I got there, I just, for me, I don't think I was ready for WNBL. I don't think I was ready to like, you know, just like as a player, like I was very undeveloped still. Um, and I got to Virginia Tech and like, I fell in love immediately. Like the connection with Coach Brooks was like instant. Um, and it was like, I'm not a very trusting person in a, in a sense that I'm going to be like, yeah, let's go. Let's do it right now. Um, but the way that he just like sold me on like his vision and like a four year plan, it wasn't just like he was going to, you know, pick me and use me and whatever. Like he just like sold me on the school and like the family aspect. Cause I am on the East coast. It's so far away from home. So he just like pretty much convinced me and I committed on spot. Um, best impulse decision I've made <laughs> ever. Um, but yeah, I think over these three and a bit years I've, I've developed and that was my main goal was really just to, you know, just get better every single year. 
I guess it must have been pretty crazy at first, you know, going from Ballarat to then a college of 37,000 people. What was the kind of change of environment like when you first arrived? And what were the little everyday just things from Australia that you missed the most? Yeah, so I, well, for you guys who don't know where Blacksburg is, it's in southwest Virginia, which is in the south. Um, So the southern culture in itself is very different. Um, Campus life, you go on a dorm. I lived with 10 girls my first semester. Like, And they they all played different sports, like swimming. My roommate used to get make me so mad. She would wake up at 4 a.m. every morning to go to swim practice. But I think the biggest thing for me was the food. Like my stomach was so sore for like two weeks when I first got there. (laughs) Just the whole change in diet. Um... And just, like, the level and intensity of training you do over there just, like, increases so much. Um, but I had to, like, fuel for practices. And then because I was practicing so much, my stomach was, like, I was just hungry all the time and just probably not fueling myself with the best <laughs> options. So it took me a year to figure that one out. But little day things, I guess, too, just the slang I use, people weren't understanding me much. Um, and I know you mentioned it a bit before, but pretty soon after you got there, the first COVID lockdown started. What was that kind of like for you apart from the change in accent? Yeah, just a bit, you know, uncertain. No one knew what was happening really. Um, and I think my assistant coach at the time, she's at another school now, but she was like, I think the safest thing for you to do is to stay because you don't know whether or not, you know, travel bans, all of that. Um, and then also like we still had a season. So we still did like bubble things um but like I was sad not going home but from what I was like hearing from my family at home it was probably a lot more strict than it was in the United States yeah um we were still able to like practice and lift um we would have like allocated time slots like we had our own facilities so we weren't coming into contact with people okay um So I do think that it paid off for sure because I was still able to live a relatively normal routine scheduled life. Um, And I still like, at the end of the day, like I love basketball. So I was able to like still shoot, go to a court, go and train. Whereas I think like my sister here, like couldn't do that a lot of times. Yeah, that's true. I guess it's, you went over at kind of the right time, but also the wrong time, but at least you can still play a bit. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Apart from eating lots of food during the week, during the season while you're at college, what does a normal week look like for you? Yeah, um, I mean, we have classes. Uh, I think COVID's changed that a lot because of um, we have a lot of online classes now. Usually I would maybe take two online and three in person. Um, So in season, Monday's our off day because we play Thursday, Sunday. Um, So a lot of my days, you know, it's classes, rehab, ice tubbing, you know, and then you have to get taped, watch film. Like my regular day, I would probably wake up maybe 7 a.m., catch the bus in, go to my first class, second class, eat, practice facility, and then I'm taping. We're watching film. I'm watching individual film, t- team film, the other team's film, practice, and then maybe try and squeeze in some shooting or individual work. So it's it's really chock a block Like I don't come home. Like I leave at 7, I don't come home for like, 6.37 sometimes like it's full on seems chaotic but fun at the same time I guess do you have a favorite oh, yeah. favorite class oh I take some weird classes because <laughs> in America they do it by like um credits and you have to fulfill like pathways and stuff like that so you know I've taken from like financial planning to intro to criminology to what like Harry I was in a Harry Potter class last summer oh wow so you had to watch the movies and then write report like canvas discussions on it which was crazy that that's even offered but I mean I would say the Harry Potter class if you were to have you know you got the day off training there was no game and you didn't have any classes at all what would an ideal day look like for you In Blacksburg, there's not really a beach or anything. (laughs) If I was in Australia, I'd probably be going to know (laughs) Nando's or the beach or something like that. But wholeheartedly when I'm in America and it's a day off or maybe it's like preseason, like probably sleep in a bit. And then honestly, I watch a lot of women's soccer, women's football, whatever you, wherever you're from, whatever you call it, just because, you know, like the, the European leagues, they kind of play in the morning time in America. So I like wake up, flick that on watch it, clean my house, do homework, very chill because I'm exhausted. 
Who are you going to support in the World Cup then, USA or Australia? <laughs> I have to say Australia. I have to say Australia. And I wholeheartedly believe that that is the right choice, but it doesn't mean that I don't top it from my American friends. Yeah, you can, you can go for a bit of both of them, I guess, if you are living in the US, because it's probably pretty right. bad. <laughs> right. Another thing too, like I remember, because it happened last year, like I was like full on watching like all the Euro games, the women's Euro. That was like insane. Yeah, it's it's great. Like just, you know, the quality of like, you know, women's basketball, women's soccer, it's just all getting better. And, you know, I love watching it all. It's great. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I guess what it's like, what is it like just, you know, walking around the college as a student when you've got a pretty huge profile? Is it easy for you to be a normal student? Do you get recognised a lot? Um, After the Final Four, like, I would be walking the street and someone put down their car window and yell at me. Um, <laughs> or, like, just, like, a lot of photos and, like, a lot of people just, like, offer to, like, buy you dinner and stuff like that. And it's like, no, thanks. Like, I really <laughs> don't need that. Um, But... Like Blacksburg, it's a small college town and everyone gets around everything. So like it, it was actually a struggle for us to like not go and do normal things because we're not it's not like we're celebrities, but like I just can't go and like like slip up or like misbehave or, you know, like people's yeah. impressions of me are like they're set on the first like 10 seconds they meet me. So I always have to be like good. I oh, can't I- be in like a bad grid or anything like that because then people just... <laughs> Yeah, that's true. Get the wrong message. <laughs> um, but just I guess let's just recap this last season because it's been pretty crazy for you. You were the first player to score a triple double in Hokies history. You were the most you were you scored the most three pointers in a season for the Hokies. The A um A double C tournament MVP. You helped the Hokies reach the Elite Eight and Final Four for the first time. You were voted most underrated player in college basketball. I'm sure there's a lot more statistics, you know, that I haven't mentioned. But when you do look back on last season, does it feel real or is it kind of like an out of body experience? Uh, I so much happened um, that it's like I really had to take a step back and like fully reflect on everything that had happened because. Within, you know, we, we play the season and that's full on as it gets. And then you go, you have a, not a, even a week, a few days to prepare for the tournament. And then the tournament is back to back to back games. And then you want to celebrate with your team because you won the ACC championship, but you can't because you have to prepare for the NCA tournament, which you're the one seed. So that's already so much pressure. And then you host, but like, and for the first time in a few years, we, we hosted the tournament. So it's like there was never really a time to like fully reflect until it was over. And unfortunately for us, it was over when we lost to LSU. So it's like that's not really worth like celebrating, if that makes sense. But it's like you can't. I mean, LSU is a great team. Like obviously they won and all those players are incredible. Um, But we were just like we lost seasons over. But like you can't like discredit everything else that you did during that year. So took a long time for us to sit back and like actually talk about all the good stuff that happened and not just, you know, we ended on a loss. Yeah, I guess when you do look back at all those stats, it is pretty crazy. I think I forgot one. Most wins in Hokies history, so I did forget one. Um, And I think, like you mentioned at the beginning, you're not, um, I guess, exactly like, you know, you're not always going to be the tallest player on the court compared to a lot. I think you're five foot six. Has that ever been kind of an issue on your journey in terms of maybe having to prove yourself a bit more or if you're being knocked back? Yeah, I never really, I don't know if I just didn't hear or didn't register people like comment about my height, but it wasn't really like a factor growing up. Um, But then I think when I got over to America, everyone was like making comments about my height. Like, what do you mean? Like all of that. Um, But I think like even the best thing with Coach Brooks was like, he has made me, use my height to my advantage really like a lot of my shots come off of step back or like change of pace all of that like it's not like necessarily an issue but you know sometimes I wish I was six foot who doesn't like it probably would help a little bit um for my sport especially but I think you know when people just say like you're to this to that like my favorite thing to do ever is just to prove people wrong and shut them up so like if people want to keep commenting about all of that then go ahead because that's just motivation for me really that's true. I guess I would use it as motivation as well. And it's good knowing that you, yeah. know, you can still get around people and you can still be the best player because I'm definitely not the tallest, you know, on the teams I've played myself. So, you know, that's, that's good mm-hmm. to know. Yeah. 
And can you maybe just like explain for those of us who don't really know the feeling, what it's like, you know, when you just have the ball in your hands, you just kind of have control of everything and you feel like every shot will go in? <laughs> um, yeah, sometimes I, I think I made a joke about like when I shoot, I black out. Like I genuinely do <laughs> just like shoot. Like you have to have enough confidence in yourself to know that like you've shot this shot a million times before, like in, in games and in practice, just messing around with your mates, like, at the end of the day, it's the same shot, just different situations. Um, so just having enough confidence in myself that I can shoot them and can make them. Um, but aside from that, you know, I am a point guard. So a lot of the the tempo and the offense is like literally in my hands. And I don't really think about it that much until like, you know, we're sitting here talking about it. But in the moment, it just feels natural. And it's kind of weird to be in control of a whole team like your coach's mini me that's what he says like I, I have to reflect what he is and he's very cool calm collected and I have to be that too but I love it I really do yeah uh, and then I guess there's also days you know when it's the opposite and maybe nothing really seems to go in the basket what's your mindset like then yeah um plenty of games where that has happened one specifically was Syracuse I think I took so many threes and not one of them hit um, but I think my job as a point guard specifically, like it's more than just scoring. <clears throat> so a lot of it for me was, you know, what can I do in defense? Um, for me, like Syracuse, that game, you know, they played like a weird extended zone. So I was like, how can I get around this and still control the team? And how can I facilitate? Like, that's the biggest thing when shots aren't hitting is how can I pass to my teammates? Cause I've got some incredible teammates that can score just as well as anyone else. Um, so yeah, that's my, my mindset shifts to that. It's not always about scoring. Yeah. Um, and your sister Gemma is a bit younger than you and she's starting to make teams now and she's playing in the NBL one. What kind of advice do you like to give to her or do you just kind of let her go off and do things in her own way? Um, we are very similar in the way that we don't really like not like being told what to do, but like if I came out and gave her advice, she'd be a bit weird about it. (laughs) But if she came to me asking any questions, I would a hundred percent chat to her. So I'm not going to like interfere myself with what she wants to do, but I just like, you know, want her to know that no matter like what she has to ask or what she's going through, like I can be here to like genuinely talk about it. Cause I think everyone's pathway is different and hers is already so much different to mine. Um, and I already do feel bad because a lot of times people will be like, Oh, Georgia did this. Why aren't you doing this? Or you know, Georgia does this. Why don't you do that? Like she's her own player. She's, her, she's very much an independent woman. <laughs> um, but yeah, just like knowing not really advice and like, you have to do this, you have to do that. But if you ever like runs into an issue, like a hundred percent, I'm there to just chat it out with her and give her guidance. I'm not going to tell her what to do because she doesn't <laughs> recite, recept that very well. I have a younger sister as well. So it's cool that that's another thing that we have in common. <laughs> I know, right? Does she annoy you? Are you at that age where it's just annoying? I mean, yeah, because she, she's 10 now and I'm 13. So, but, you know, we, oh. we get along most of the time. Like, I'm sure you and your sister do as well. But Yeah, I mean, we're the same age gap, like four years. And there's a little time where it gets super annoying. But the older you grow, the closer you'll get. It, it won't all be always whining and fighting. <laughs> yeah, younger siblings are great. But... um. And just going on to a bit of a different topic, I guess, college basketball is now, you know, huge and some of the girls are becoming massive names, but then some of them get drafted into the WNBA and they cut by sides, you know, less than a couple of weeks. Do you have an opinion on maybe how the system can make the most of those girls who have a lot of fans? Yeah, I think now is a very, very important time for women's basketball because I think a big part of this number one NIL rules have changed so this is where people are getting their image from you know there's some girls that maybe aren't as good as others in terms of skill but they're more profitable or more marketable so that's changed a whole lot of things um and then social media in general I think a big difference when I was growing up from America to Australia was everyone in America had a highlight tape or they were on Instagram and getting posted all the time. Whereas here we didn't really do that much. Um, and I think it's a time now where it definitely needs change. And I think that, you know, all the players are great. You're in the WNBA for a reason and it's not the player's fault. I think there definitely needs to be an expansion. Um, but I think in the next couple of years, you know, you've got some really big profitable names coming up and you've got some, attention being drawn to the league so I think the league needs to do something about it for sure 
Um, whether or not we see that soon or not, I'm not sure. I don't know how the business side works, but you think about like, you know, Caitlin Clark, Paige Beckers, Haley Van Lith, even Angel Reese, like she has like what, 1.2 million followers now, maybe? Yeah. A ridiculous amount of fault. Like any any team that would get that kind of attention for like women's sports, you know, people are starting to watch it. And this is an all type of sports. This isn't just basketball, you know. Yeah, that's true. It's it's crazy now, you know, like but Yeah, uh, like even like the the NWSL just had an expansion. Like if they can do it. Yeah, why can't why can't like, sports, I guess? Right, exactly. I guess we'll see what happens though. Um, yeah. I actually remember seeing one of your interviews a little while ago after a game last season in front of, you know, a massive crowd, and you said, I think it's something that all women's sports should get to experience. From your experience in college basketball, you know, massive crowds, lots of fans, what do you think more sports can do so that they can, you know, see those massive crowds as well? Yeah, I think I've said it before in, like, other interviews too, like, if you just, like, go to a women's game, like, people go to women's sports and they're like, oh, it's not like the men's, it's not as this it's not as that like yeah. you know what I'm five foot six and I can't dunk like is but how many dunks do you actually see in a game how many dunks do you see the Denver Nuggets and Miami Heat do in the finals like it's not that's not what makes basketball and if you like go to a sport open-minded and you just watch you can tell that like men and different men and women are different yes but it's like different for a reason like I feel like when I'm watching the men's like it's definitely more like in America like one-on-one like skill all that but like women like especially our team like our system is so flowing and like we we play a pretty pretty brand of basketball the way we move the ball and all that um so just like not comparing men and women's sports in general because they're both good for good reason and then even just like if you just want to go to a woman's game any single game and just sit there and watch you can be on your phone for 10 minutes like it doesn't matter like if you're just there I I can guarantee you'll be enticed pretty quick to put your phone down and watch the games I make an effort at Virginia Tech to go to as many women's sports games as I can it's like softball track swimming like all of that I make the effort to just go and sit and watch because that support goes a whole a long way yeah, definitely. I think like you said before, you know, if, you know, the women maybe can't dunk as much. I feel like I was seeing a couple of people maybe argue about it a little while ago. Like, although, you know, the women don't get as many fans and, you know, you guys can't dunk as much. Like, the games are new, you know, they're still both awesome. And even if you just go to a game and, you know, sit there and watch for like 10 minutes, the quality is still amazing and you'll still have lots of fun. And sometimes yeah, it's good exactly. that it's not as loud because sometimes my ears hurt at, you know, really, really, <laughs> really loud games, but I won't complain at that um, at the World Cup. Yeah. And I also think, you know, like in general too, like the dunking thing or whatever, like have you seen Caitlin Clark shoot from the logo? Have you seen like all these girls like literally break ankles and like, like it's not all about like, like we do flashy stuff. Yeah. Like Like it's not. Like, you know, really cool shots can be just as good as dunks, if not better, because I think they are. Exactly. I actually did ask some people to send in some questions for this interview and we got a lot of them from right around the world more than I think any other interview. So let's get into the mix zone. So first of all, after such a huge last season, what's your goal for the Hokies this year? And that's from Mariana at NC State. My goal for this year, I think, first of all, I mean, it, my teammates, you know, Liz and Kayla, it's their last year. I've grown up with them. This is like their definite final year and, this year for me too, it could be my final year. So just enjoying, you know, every single game. And yes, we had a successful year last year. And I think that made us build a lot of confidence going into the next year. But it really, it sounds cliche, but it really is game by game. But, you know, we've we've pretty much been essentially, except for the championship game, to the very almost top. Um, so I think that experience is going to take us a fair while, a fair, a fair way. Mariana also wants to know who's your favorite singer or artist? Ooh. now I've blanked I love a lot of Calvin Harris and then I have like two songs that I have to listen to pre-game and it's <laughs> Work by Iggy Azalea and it's Talk That Talk by Rihanna so those like two songs are always on my like Spotify most played because it's like superstitious for me yeah those songs are great um and Joan wants to know what it was like at Kelsey Plum's training camp yeah, that was the coolest thing, I think, you know, aside from the final four, obviously, but like that's one of the coolest things I've ever done because 
Kelsey is one of my idols and, you know, watching her play and she's short too. She's like five, eight or something like that. Um, but, you know, going to that camp, like we played against her, like she's sitting there eating lunch with us, giving us advice, like not even like giving us advice, but just like chatting, like she's just like an, a normal human, which she is, but to me, she's insane. So just to have like a regular conversation with her and just know that she's there, like if anything is needed, like that's really cool. Um, and I learned so much from that camp. So. I'm probably not going to pronounce it right because I'm not as cool as Kelsey, but you won her dog award, right? Uh-huh, I did. That must have been pretty cool. So, it was really cool, um, especially too because you go to that camp and you have like some of the best guards in college basketball. Like I mentioned her before, Haley Van Liff. She's insane. Um, Diamond Miller just got drafted and she's playing for the Lynx right now. Um, so to be a part of that camp and to get that award was like, it was, I got goosebumps really because – Number one, you're playing against those girls, but number two, Kelsey Plum is handing you like a reward and just like <laughs> putting you out there to be like the dog of the camp. Like that was like a really, really cool moment. Yeah, Kelsey's awesome. It was like my aim to like, you know, chat to her or interview her at the World Cup. And I got to make her like these veggie my earrings, which I got to give to her. <laughs> she she was awesome about it. She's great. <laughs> yeah, she's really lovely. Nick asks, do you want to go pro after college? I do. I want to travel so bad with basketball. Um, definitely, you know, like the WNBA, as we discussed, it's hard right now to get into and all of that. And obviously knowing that, so it's not my, it's obviously a goal, but it's not my be all end all because at the end of the day, like I do want to travel with basketball. I have a lot of go-to places. I definitely want to try and see. Um, but yeah, I definitely want to keep playing for as long as I can. Is there any specific country in the world that you maybe haven't been to yet that you really want to visit? Yeah, I definitely want to play in France. <laughs> France or like even, I know like the UK doesn't really have like a big whatever, but I definitely want to play like near London or something like that, as all Australian girls want to do, I feel like, <laughs> visit London. Um, but anywhere in Europe, really, I'm just really down for. Yeah, Europe's awesome. I really want to go there as well. Um, mm -hmm. Melissa wants to know, where can we find official Georgia Amor merch? When you find it let me know because <laughs> I don't I don't have I don't, well and I worked hard with international students to do stuff like that um so we'll see if I hear, hear any updates I'll send it out but I'm not sure um just quite yet you should definitely start a line I would definitely buy some stuff <laughs> we'll, we'll chat about it later <laughs> who knows um, and finally, Gordon asks, since you've brought teammates Liz Kitley and Kayla King to experience beautiful Australia, please ask her if she can imagine a larger reoccurring vision of of a Virginia Tech Lady Hoopers visit. Gordon is suggesting an annual game called the Commonwealth Clash, where the best of Virginia <laughs> universities, Virginia Tech and Virginia, play against an Aussie team. What do you think about that? It sounds pretty cool. And that's one thing I noticed too. Like they have the Commonwealth of Virginia and I was like, Commonwealth? Like, I've heard this a billion <laughs> times before. Um, that would be sick as, like, a event fundraising thing. Maybe in the off-season, though. Definitely not in a pre-season or season. I'm a bit tired for that. That would be cooler. It would be pretty cool having, like, what, three games in Australia, two in the US, because I would definitely fly over there just to watch, like, one. But, I mean... You can be a coach. <laughs> I don't know about now, but, you know, who, who knows? Maybe I can <laughs> interview you after that. <laughs> Um, oh yeah, you can be the. Do you know Holly Row? Yeah, be the Holly Row. That's actually cool too. <laughs> she came up to us and she like sat next to us and interviewed us. That's after the ACC championship. That was also very very cool. Okay, that's really cool. Um, well, that's the end of the mix in. But I just have one final question myself. After saying I'd never any more before, you've come from a horse farm in Ballarat and you've now achieved some pretty incredible things on a global stage. What would your advice be to kids out there who have a dream about? who have a dream out there, but perhaps are feeling like they're not, you know, the tallest or the best or they aren't coming from the right upbringing? Yeah, you just stick with it, really. Um, for me, it very much played out. And I just knew at the end of the day, I loved basketball. Like I wasn't, you know, trying to put too much stress on myself to essentially be the best. I was just sticking with it and I loved it. Um, and just, you know, you put in the work, you will see the results 110%. Um and, you know, people always say you're too this, you're too that, you don't have this. Like, I used to travel two hours on weekdays just to go to, like, a single training session. Like, as long as you're dedicated and you see it through, like. And, you know, remember how I mentioned that Patty Mills sent me that video? 
he said a big thing for him was to stay the course. And so like, that's just something that I've run with is just trust in yourself and just stay with it. And I think it'll work out pretty fine. Yeah, well, thanks for the advice. Um, that's all my questions, Georgia, but thanks so much for joining me. I can't wait to see you play in the years ahead. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Thanks for listening. To support Herway, visit the link in the description section.